just like to introduce Paul Knight, uh, a very accomplished speaker. Dr. Paul Knight has a PhD, uh, had a career, um, a career in the forces uh, as well, um, but he's a very accomplished author and speaker. I've heard him speak many times. Um, he has a great interest in the Gallipoli campaign and the Northwest, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome him here. And over to you, Paul. Okay, hey, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, excellent introduction as ever, Ian. Um, yeah, I mean, just to pick up on the conversation that we, people were having before, I have no ancestors who are at Gallipoli at all. Um, I am um, an officer in the, what was the Territorial Army, now the Army Reserve. Um, my last post, I commanded the last Royal Signal Squadron in the northwest of England, which includes a troop in Manchester, which is 842 true, and the, the 42 is descended from you know the uh, divisional signals company at um at Gallipoli. So that's the, the closest connection I have. Um I'm still serving, I actually work in army lessons and uh, historical lessons. One of the things we're looking at doing is producing study packs to help the army do battlefield studies better. And one of them that I want to try and write next year is on um, Gallipoli, but focusing on 42nd Division, so can provide all the materials um, available for, for, the, uh, for the soldiers, particularly when there are people who do not, or units that don't have history buffs um, in them. Um, I suppose, I'll, um, yeah, so that's my, that's my interest, and this is the way that I'm gonna come at this uh, talk this evening. So I will just bring up the, Presentation. Let's get this right way around, and we'll uh, we'll crack on. While I'm doing that, so we did give in the regional conference just before COVID and all that unpleasantness, um, a talk about the early days of the 42nd Division. I think that's it. So what I'm going to do is a little bit of a recap on that to set the scene, and then some of the interesting points I found about the division. I'm not going to do a um, a talk through the division's time there because you can get that in books and that's and I'm sure everybody in fact I'm sure there's plenty of people who know that that information already um so that this is me um yeah I'm a still serving major and I work in the army's historical lessons um team so really just as a little bit of a, a background East Lancashire division it becomes 42 division in 1915 at, at Gallipoli but um, I'll use the numbers because it will, 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 will runs off the tongue a bit easier. Standard territorial brigade, uh, division, sorry, three brigades, each of four battalions, Lancashire Fusiliers, East Lancashires, and the, the Manchesters, which um, we were just dis discussing earlier. I don't think the Lancashire Fusiliers got to mention though. Um, so this is a, the, uh, the, the infantry component of the division. All the other uh, supporting arms are listed here. Um, put a few little bits in red because on the, the Duke of Lancaster's own yeomanry is the divisional cavalry, but only a squadron goes out with them to um, Egypt and then Gallipoli. You've got four four brigades, four regiments of artillery, plus the, the supply column, two field companies, Royal Engineers. And these will be reinforced with a third when they're in Gallipoli. And this is standard across the British Army. They realise that with the First World War, the way it's going, people or divisions need the extra engineer support. And actually, it's one of the West Lancashire uh, Territorial Field Companies that's uh, sent to support 42 Division. And they spend the rest of the war out in, um, out in, out in the Eastern Mediterranean. So um, had a relatively... Um, relatively good war as these things go. The Visual Signals Company, that's my particular interest, field ambulances and uh, you know, divisional supply train. So this is the this is the uh, the division. It's a fairly standard territorial force division for the time. These are the books I've referred to, although it sounds like there's a privately published book we need to add on to this list. So if people are interested, I'll bring this list up at the end so you can go back and read um, the books I've, I've referred to or, or, or referenced as we're going through. 
So these are what the territorials are looking like pre-war, um, pre-deployment. The, the territorials are organised on a county basis, um, except for Lancashire, who has two counties because it's such a big organisation. East Lancashire Division and the West Lancashire Division, and they are both funded separately. It's end up to the um, county associations how they spend the money. A lot of the territorials are still wearing this 1903 leather bandolier equipment, which is issued to the regular army. The regular army hates it. They then get the Mills Web equipment, which is just standard um, equipment for the First World War infantry which means there's a lot of this equipment available for the territorials. And as the territorials are home defence, then actually you don't need the uh, top level equipment. They're also equipped with the old Lee Metford rifles, which you'll see here and you know, signified by the, um, the, the barrel extends further forward than the, the wooden stock. Again, it's an obsolete rifle, but it will do for home defence force. The big problem for this is in practice is that the ammunition used in this rifle and the ammunition used for this short magazine Lee Enfield is different. So you, when you're relieving um, other units in the trenches, if they've got the, the more modern rifle, you have to exchange the ammunition as well, which is um, becomes a bit, bit of an embuggerance and a bit, you know, a bit of a nuisance. But these are what these guys are looking at, uh, looking like pre, um, pre-war. On mobilization on, on um, 4th of August 1914, territories are mobilized at the, at the outbreak of the war. And um, essentially, they'll go to the drill, drill hall to be mobilized and they'll be sent back home. Uh, and that seems to be the routine for the first couple of days. The mobilization commitment is only home defense. There is no requirement for the territorials to serve overseas at this point. But on the 10th of August, Lord Kitchener realises that the, the war is going to be bigger than has been anticipated, has been planned for, and he invites the territorials to volunteer. There's lots of umming and ahhing about this until basically the, the unions in the army um, get their way that the territorials will volunteer for overseas service, but only as formed units. They don't want to be split up to be sent all over the you know, and joining other units. They want to stay with their mates. And this is critical on how the territorials are used afterwards. Um, about 90%, we believe, of the East Lancashire Division volunteers for overseas service. This is um, was actually concentrated outside the, um, outside the city at Littleborough Camp, which is um, about an hour's train journey north of Manchester. It's a beauty spot today. The division was concentrated there to try and do some... Um, uh, training also had a lot of recruits to um, integrate into the numbers to bring itself up to up to speed, up to strength. On the fifth of September, they are notified that they are going overseas to Egypt, and they depart nine days late. So four days later, on the 9th of September, um, forty trains it takes to get the division to uh, Portsmouth, and then on the tenth of September. 15 and a half thousand men sailed. So less than six weeks in, into the war, 15 and a half thousand men are sailing overseas. Some of these had not been in the army when the war broke out. That's the first division to do so. Now, not everybody goes to the division. You don't have to volunteer. There's the overage, underage, medically downgraded, um, just not fit or just not volunteering to go overseas. And Norman Hall, who um, he'll actually serve in second, fifth Lancashire Fusiliers, the 55th West Lancashire Division. Um, in his memoirs, um, he's um, training up new uh, new recruits in a, in a new company. It says actually he gets some of the um, some of those from the first fifth Lancashire Fusiliers who have not volunteered to go overseas. It says actually. My NCOs were pretty hopeless for several old sergeants left behind by the first fifth Lancashire Fusiliers and no wonder. So this is an opportunity for units to get rid of those people that they don't want to go to war as well. So I said the 52nd Division, the first territorial divisions to go overseas. 
And that's significant because in 1915, when numbers are issued to the territorial divisions, they've all got the same seniority. They're all formed on the first day, which is the 1st of April, uh, 1908. There's 41 divisions in the army at that point, and numbers are then issued in the order that the division goes overseas as a complete division. And because, for the, because the sanctioned division is the first one to go overseas, they become number 42. They are the senior reserve uh, unit in the whole British Army to this day. As I used to point out to my troop in Manchester, 842 troop, they are the senior reserve signals in the British Army. And off to slightly sunnier climbs, this is uh, the um, Manchester Brigade, four battalions of them formed up in the sun of Egypt. And I do wonder how many you know, working class people from Wigan, my hometown, and Oldham and Blackburn volunteered because they heard the division was going to Egypt and it sounded uh, quite exciting. First couple of months in Egypt is actually quite easy. And um, this is a, a um, uh, Christmas card being sent home by one of the um, field companies. Up until Christmas, they seem to have quite an easy time. In the new year, the training starts to go up, up a, a stage. Some of the engineers and the artillery are involved defending the Suez Canal from Turkish attacks, but the division as a whole does not get involved in any actions. In fact, one of the um, battalions is garrisoning in Khartoum and forms a camel company. So having a very interesting, very interesting time. But eventually you get to Gallipoli. Um, not on the first landings, but they could come in a couple of weeks later. And at this early stage of the war, actually the, uh, the feedback or the, the comments are actually really um, positive. They do seem to like the countryside. Um, Colonel Henry Darlington of First Fifth Manchester's um, yeah, likens the countryside to Slayburn, these are Yorkshire Moors, and so does um, Lieutenant James, also in uh, First Fifth Manchester's. Um, yeah, likening the countryside to the Yorkshire Moors, which is, I've only ever been to uh, Gallipoli in the summertime, and by that point it's usually a little bit barren and, um, and burnt out by that point. Now, um, Gregory uh, Sidney James, unfortunately, he is killed on, on the, the 4th of June, 1915 in 3rd uh, Caritia. Um, this actual um, line is, is it's taken from um, one of the books, but the original um, um, description is to a the Hay Parish Church magazine, and Hay is, is um, um, one, one, one of the parishes in uh, Wigan, on the Manchester side of Wigan, if you know that at all. Um, so unfortunately, he is killed on the 4th of July, 4th of June, 1915 in Third Caritia. He is the son of the Reverend C.H. James and Emily James, who are, um, have a rectory in uh, Nottingham. Um, although at the time, um, or at the time he's mobilized, he's actually living in, in Wigan. And unfortunately, he's only 22 years old at the time. The realities of, of war do seem to uh, kick in pretty quickly and this early time of the year is a, uh, it's still a bit chilly, which would probably account for the, um, the differences in the um, uh, weather conditions. Um, Colonel Darlington is stripping off anything from his uniform that's making him distinctive. He's carrying, he's wearing putties rather than riding boots. He's got rid of his leather, Sam Brown equipment and got web equipment and he's carrying a rifle already. Looks like, sounds like a short magazine in the Anfield as well, one of the new ones. Alec Riley, who um, Michael Crane was saying before, this is um, the diary that uh, um, Michael Crane's editing. Never come this across, across this before, wrapping his, his putties around his feet for warmth, it was that cold. Um, I would have left my boots on to be honest, but that's him. But one of the things I'm particularly interested in, because I work in army lessons, is the how the army in 1915 goes about its business of actually uh, fighting and, and the orders. Um, Ginger earlier on was saying he's interested in how well the division fights. So that this is 
just the, the first couple of paragraphs, I'm, I'm replicated the, the, the whole document from the Army Corps Order Number no. 2 of the 3rd of June, 1915. So this is the day before Third Committee takes place. Um, so this is the, the, the core orders. Um, and this is the um, top of the divisional orders. And you'll notice it's also written on the 3rd of June. This image here, which I haven't got round to transcribing, is one of the three, what we are, one of the brigade operational orders, also issued on the 3rd of June. Um, the other two brigades either didn't have a written order or they've not, not been kept. What's interesting about this from an army point of view is that three sets of orders have been issued on exactly the same day in preparation for attack that's going to take place tomorrow. Uh, this is incredibly quick turnaround. Um, in a similar study that we've actually done of an armoured division in Normandy in 1944, they were also able to do the corps, the division and the brigade orders issued on the same day for an attack going in the following day. But when we sort of have conversations about this in the modern British army, this would be almost impossible to do because there's so much more, um, so much more complicated, but also the increase use of computers that has allowed more and more paperwork to be generated, which has slowed down the whole process. And this is um, this is what we refer to as an OODA loop. It's like a planning cycle. Not so much a problem if you're doing trench warfare and you're doing a deliberate attack. If you're doing like a maneuver warfare, say in, in, you know, in, in um, Europe in the Second World War, the regiment that can move faster and get its orders out faster and then react to them faster gets inside the planning cycle of the enemy and gives them a major advantage. So the fact that these three sets of orders are issued on one day is remarkably quick. Um, and we struggle to do it today. And this is one of the things that we keep looking at. Of course, it's all very well and good getting your orders out quickly, but are they any good? So that, oh. I appear to have missed a slide here. What should be here actually is one of the, um, Official history maps of um, uh, Third Critia. Sorry, don't know what's happened there. Oh, I've not misplaced that. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, not really going to refer to the map. It's more of a um, uh, well, a page filler, really. Um, for those who are asking about how effective the uh, you know, the division is in attack, this is a, the division's first action. Um, they start off with, with a uh, deception action to try and capture the Turks in the trench, or make sure the Turks are in the trenches. Um, so at 11.30, all the guns that have been firing in support stopped. And this was a signal for all the infantry in the trenches to start cheering and waving their rifles and bayonets as if they were about to attack. Um, they don't attack, guns open up again, and they, they capture, hope, well, the plan is to... Uh, to be able to kill some of the Turks in the trenches who've got out of their own dugouts and are more vulnerable. The attack goes in. The first line is, uh, Turkish first line is captured in the first five minutes. Second line about 30 minutes later. And troops enter the fourth line later on in the afternoon. But this is part of an attack which is going all the way across the peninsula. Um, one of the commentators says, you know, looking left and right, you've got men on the line about five miles long, all getting out and moving forward together. And initially, this is actually remarkably successful. Problem is, on the far right, um, the Turks counterattack. They drive the French out of the haricot position. That leaves the Royal Naval Division exposed, and they were immediately on the left of the French. So the Royal Naval Division has to pull back. And this leaves uh, 42nd Division exposed. And basically, they're about 300 metres further forward with a big gap on their left. Um, two companies of the 8th Lancashire Fusiliers have moved forward to plug this gap, but they're being attacked on all sides by the Turks. And in the evening, 42nd Division is ordered to uh, withdraw to more secure positions, so they have to give up a lot of what they captured. They still hold about 400 yards, and it, but they've penetrated 
a thousand yards. So they've actually done really well. It's just the wider picture has failed and therefore they've um, had to pull back. This is, um, I've taken Colonel Darlington again of uh, First Fifth Manchester's. His, in, in his diary, how the men came back cursing and swearing, um, saying that they all they needed was reinforcements. Um, quite calm, but very angry. And you can imagine having spent a whole day fighting and then being told to pull back um, how, the, um, how the men must have felt. And, you know, this is the loneliness of command that he's had to make this decision to uh, pull the men back because it's the only way to save them all from being uh, wiped out themselves. I was not popular for several for several days. And, you know, this is um, this is when the battalion commander really does earn his pay, his pay, sorry. Now, Neil Drum and uh, Roger Dowson in their book on the 1st, 7th Lancashire Fusiliers, they say that the Turkish 9th Division who are uh, facing 42nd Division, Turkish 9th Division thought that if the Allies had attacked one more time, then the Turks would have been defeated. But as uh, Colonel Darlington says here, I tried to get reinforcements, but of course there were none, there never are. So actually, I would say the division did uh, really well in their tasks and in their role. The As the summer goes on, the, the uh, uh, you know, the frontal attacks uh, stop, and there's only really one more, which is in, in, in support of the uh, Suvla Bay campaign, uh, Suvla Bay landing, sorry. Um, however, the, move, move into a phase of um, trench warfare, which involves uh, lots of mines and lots of craters. And I've become interested in this because um, not that the modern British Army is interested in trenches, uh, but if you look at what's happening in the Ukraine at the moment, the Ukrainians are building a large trench system. You know, part of breaking trench systems is um, blowing them up traditionally from below in the crater, but with modern technology, probably you know, able to attack them from above as well. But suddenly we become interested in how trenches work. And Cowley's crater on the bottom right here is um, associated with a Captain Harold T. Cowley, Cowley sorry, Sixth Manchester's, um, he's also an MP, Member of Parliament. Now, Sixth Manchester's were the quote, collar and cuff battalion. That's to say they're a very middle class battalion and they're raised in the, um, the commercial sector of Manchester City Centre. You do get quite a few of these uh, in the territorials. Liverpool, Glasgow, London have a few. Were um, even to join as a private, you expected to have a slightly better class of job um, and certainly the officers were you know um, some, some of the um, you know so, so, uh, society's elite and how Cowley I think is, is one of those um, rugby school New College Oxford barrister member of parliament and his uh, his parents are lady uh, lord and lady from uh, Lemster so quite well to do gentlemen um, Volunteers to go overseas in August 1914, and he's serving as the aide de camp to the um, divisional commander, Major General Douglas. Now, there's a photograph of him in um, Hartley's book on the uh, Sick Manchester's, and what you see is a very studious, uh, bookish looking chap with small glasses and not looking like a, um, uh, a warrior at, at all. Nevertheless, um, appearances can be deceptive because. On 8th of September 1915, he asked to rejoin his battalion, um, saying, I've always felt rather a brute skulking away in comparative safety while my friends were being killed. In other words, being at divisional headquarters, doing an important job supporting the, the divisional commander, is feeling guilty because the uh, soldiers in the, in the front line are getting killed and the uh, people he knows. So he volunteers to put himself in the line of, of um, the field of fire. And on the um, 18th September, 6th Manchester go into the front line. A couple of days later, the Turks would detonate a mine under the uh, under the trenches, which, as I said, it's a relatively new form of warfare. And bearing in mind, it's conducted uh, silently until it actually gets detonated. 
nobody knows what's going on and the psychological effect of being on duty in the trenches when at any moment they could blow up really must have pulled on on um, on people's nerves in addition to everything else that's going on but two days after the first um yeah so yeah so two days after in in the trenches the turks um blow a mine and at dusk cowley and the party occupy the um the crater and they're there all night within 10 yards of the turkish front line and they withdraw at dawn but the following dusk, they uh, decide to reoccupy the, um, the crater because it looks like the Turks are trying to uh, dig a sap from the Turkish front line into the in into this trench into into this uh, crater. But one of the characteristics of a crater is that when you blow it up, all the contents from the the bottom of the crater obviously, obviously goes up in the air, and it drops down, and this creates a rim around the edge of the crater. If you get this right, and if you can occupy this, this uh, crater, this will give you a high point in which you can overlook the enemy positions. So consequently, both sides have an in interest in occupying the, the, um, the crater once, once, it's been, um, once it's been blown. But early on in the war, this, this, the, the significance of this probably isn't realized because it doesn't seem to be a huge incentive to get in these craters and secure them and, and, and um, go um, and fortify them. But if you're familiar with the um, the first day of the Somme and the blowing of the mines on the Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt, um, and that story and the, you know, the famous footage of the, of the mine being blown up, you'll you'll also be aware that the Germans are able to reoccupy the, uh, the positions in this new crater before the British could get there. The Germans were then able to set up machine guns and that destroyed the attack of the first Lancashire Fusiliers, um, who of course were also at Gallipoli at, the, at this time. So this is a, an extreme example of the importance of capturing these these craters and what would have what could go wrong if things if the enemy get the crater before you. So at dusk on this second occasion, Cowley and his party are um, crawling into into the trenches, um, and Cowley is shot through the temple and killed. And the corporal Frank Waring, who is, is beside him, um, writes, his body was lying close to me and I have a clear memory of his face as he lay in the bright moonlight. His face was chalky white and the whole of his nose glistened with blood. And um, Darlington, back in the uh, 5th Manchester's, um, wrote of Cowley in one of his letters home, he is a great loss to them to the uh, six Manchesters. Um, and he's buried in Lancashire Landing, uh, Lancashire Landing uh, Cemetery. Uh, had two other brothers who also fell during the First World War as well. So again, another of these families who, who've suffered heavily and, um, you know, despite the social status, you know, the loss of a son is the loss of a son. So yeah, so this is one, one of the things we're starting to get, I'm, I'm professionally getting interested in about trenches and how trenches are, are operated and work and how they could be used in the um, you know in the, in the modern environment. The other thing I'm interested in is how the division adapted to the lifestyle that it's in, the, this new operating environment, as we call it, because trenches have not really been thought about as part of the pre-war training. And um, Captain Hurst, who wrote with the Manchesters in the East, which is about the seventh Manchester, said tactics of the, the tactics of this period did not even or, even organize uh, trench raids. Which, if you think of the First World War, trench raids is a big feature, particularly on the Western Front. Um, maybe nobody had really thought about it. Maybe the trenches at Gallipoli are too close together um, to make it worthwhile dominating the terrain because you know some of these trenches are incredibly close. I don't know, but this is how the, the war develops. People, um, particularly on the Western Front, will put a lot of time and effort into trench raids and dominating no man's land. Bombing is, you know, is one, one of them, uh, which, which is quite key on, on Gallipoli, again, because of the proximity of the trenches. And we're all seeing the, you know, the famous pictures of jam jar bombs, trying to improvise, because, 
British Army had not thought that trenches were particularly relevant beforehand. Um, one of the other peculiarities is that the Territorials had old, obsolete 15 pound artillery pieces, unlike the regulars who had newer, better 18 pounders. A lot of the uh, uh, equipment the Territorials had was was uh, obsolete because of you know they were home defense for. Interesting, it was something that um, uh, Berend, he's in, um, he's Make Me a Soldier, is, is about his time with the uh, Fifth East Lancashire's. He's makes his interesting observation that the obsolete guns actually seem to have a lot more ammunition than the um, newer, more modern guns, possibly because the army in, um, in France on the Western Front getting the 18 pounders and then had first call on the new modern ammunition. Whereas the anyone producing the obsolete ammunition, well, might might have you know been sent to secondary theatres, which is probably the only time when Gallipoli seems to be better off for ammunition or anything than the Western Front. What this does mean actually is the 15 pounders, although they had a lower uh, shorter range, doesn't seem to be the problem, but plenty of ammunition to shoot off, which is uh, quite a good. Um, well, it's unusual, not, to, not what I expected to find on Gallipoli. And now this is a, yeah, this is a, the, the map which I uh, realized is uh, missing earlier on. One of the, again, one of these innovations that there's some interest in, interest in is how the division, which have been really taught to fight open warfare, you know, the traditional. Um, um, you know, green fields and manoeuvring and having cavalry out, out in the front finding enemy for you is um, how they deal with, with these new circumstances and trying to overcome the difficulties. And again, there's a section here which is taken from Darlington's account in um, August, early August 1915. So only really about three months um, into, the, into the time on, on the peninsula. And it's, he's referring to a section of the trench, which is G11H. And the section in between the two arrows is G11. On the right-hand side, you've got the vineyard, which you would be familiar with, and the, um, you know, the main Carithia Road. What they're doing is um, organising uh, what he refers to as a combined hate, and hate being a general word for, um, you know, usually artillery fire on enemy positions. But what they're doing is they're combining the mortars, the snipers and the machine guns together, um, try and make most effective use of them because each of these weapons has got slightly different characteristics. If you use them in isolation, they have a strength and they also have weaknesses. But by combining them, you can see that people are trying to sit down and think through the problem and come up with a new solution especially because mortars and then the use of snipers is not really a, um, it's not pre-war weapon systems. Um, obviously snipers have been around for a long time, but you don't really have a designated snipers in the British Army pre-war. Machine guns are also relatively new as well. And what Darlington is saying is that they're trying to, um, well, use, use these weapon systems together. So the trench mortars, would target one end of the trench G, G11H. Once they've hit the trench, that would make the, the Turks run to the far side, you know, the opposite end of the trench, in which case they would then target that end of the trench. And by breaking down the, um, the trenches, you're actually trapping the Turks inside because you, know, you expose yourself, um, obviously you like to become a target. And the trench mortars would then um, continue on the communication trenches, so you're blocking the, the party of Turks, these un unfortunate souls, in a section of the trench. But once you block, block them in, they then target the traverses, which is the, uh, the parapets, and try and blow those in, at which point the Turks are then going to be exposed, and the machine guns and the snipers uh, are then able to target the, the, um, the Turks because you know, they've lost the protection of the, um, of the trenches. And actually, it gets so bad that the Turks actually try and get out of the trenches into a nullah where they will find uh, better cover. And I'm assuming that's the nullah 
um, which is running north, south, well, sort of top to bottom, sorry, uh, straight through that section of trench. So what we find is this is like quite innovative that they are trying to work out how to uh, overcome a, a new problem, but using new new um, weapon systems. Um, again, it's going away from this that lines there by donkeys approach that they are you know not trying to uh, fi fix the problems. Now the downside to this is that it took time to target one side then the other then the, then the um, communications trenches. And of course, the Turkish artillery is not going to be passive. And this action <coughs> drew the attention of the Turkish artillery. And Colonel Darlington wrote, the trouble was it fetched the Turkish artillery on our trenches at once. And we had the most unholy shelling all day. So yeah, attack the Turks, but the Turks are going to uh, respond. At one point, the, um, the Turkish shell buried the mortars. So they had to pause, dig the mortars out and uh, you know, uh, restart firing. But again, that immediately drew uh, counter battery fire from the Turkish artillery. And this actually um, halted the whole, whole process a little bit early. The British artillery is not being used or the field artillery is not being used on this. And, and I'm assuming it's because the proximity between the British frontline trenches and the Turkish trenches so close that there's a likelihood of hitting your own trenches. So they're not being included in this. So this is a, a good example of bringing together several different skills and disciplines um, in, in this really uh, changing phase, phase of, of the war. So there's a, um, so there is a battalion machine gun officer and that's a pre-war position. That's, in this case is a Captain F.A. James who's the elder brother of the Captain James who uh, wrote uh, earlier on about how the Lipley looks like the Yorkshire Moors. There's a new post that's been created, which is a brigade machine gun officer. And at this time, it's a Captain Hayes from 7th Manchester's. So you've got new people learning new skills and trying to do, by concentrating the machine guns, you can develop the expertise of how to use them better in this new environment. And there's a brigade mortar officer as well, this captain size in this case, and mortars, as I said, are a relatively new innovation. So trying to learn how to use new weapon systems in contact with the enemy in the new environment is, is quite demanding, but they're um, having a go at it and there's a steep learning curve to them. Now the um, 5th Manchester's, their um, uh, battalion machine gun officer, Captain James, he's wounded a couple of weeks later on, on the 15th September. And he dies of his wounds the following day. And as I said, he's the um, older brother of the Lieutenant George Sidney James, who I mentioned earlier, who li like in Gallipoli to the Yorkshire Moors, um, and who'd been killed on the 4th of June in the 3rd Carithia. So again, you've, uh, um, yeah, another example of these, you know, Brothers joining up together and unfortunately uh, being killed in relatively close proximity to each other. Darlington also talks about uh, Captain Science and his trench mortars. And on a later date, about a week or so later, the trench mortars are conducting what he refers to as a private hate. In other words, they're doing their own, their own things against the Turks. Um, and, uh, you know, Darlington writing home. Um, says how we got the usual beastly re results because the Turkish artillery is conducting counter battery fire. And this unfortunately inflicted casualties on the 5th and 6th Manchesters. So Colonel Darlington goes on to say that Sayers is a top hole chap, but I do wish he wouldn't follow us around because basically every time the trench mortars open up, that becomes an indicate, uh, invitation for the Turkish artillery to fire on anything nearby, and that means that the um, Fifth Manchesters are being targeted. So, yeah, um, as the war evolves, as the, the operating environment changes, so your tactics change, but equally, the Turkish tactics will change, and this is constantly, constant to and throwing as you try to gain an advantage. And then just to wrap this all up, uh, just to bring this a uh, to an end. The division is evacuated on the 9th of January 1915 um, from Gully Beach. 
The division that covers the evacuation is 13th Division. Um, and they landed at Hellas. This is a new army division. Um, 13th Western Division, which all is recruited mostly from uh, Lancashire down into North Wales and then in the borders down towards Herefordshire, but does include four battalions uh, from Lancashire. The, there's uh, the six East Lancashire's, South Lancashire's, Loyal North Lancashire's, and King's Own. So four Lancashire battalions on number six, which is a bit confusing. Um, in that uh, brigade is also a uh, Lieutenant Clement Attlee, who you'll probably recognize, who become, later goes on to become the Prime Minister. But he is re reputedly the last um, officer to uh, leave, leave the whole of the Gallipoli Peninsula as part of his evacuation. But I do like this line out of the um, uh, divisional history where the last of the 42nd Division troops are down on Gully Beach waiting to be evacuated. There's no boats around and some wag likens it to a Saturday night out when they last missed the last train home and they're wondering what to do. So that really brings the end of my talk and um, thank you very much for listening and I'll take any questions. Thank you.